I never really um, thought about music as limited to being a performer. And, um, you know, I always thought about it on a, in a larger context than that. Like, yes, I wanted to be like a, you know, uh, like when I was a kid, a, a rock and roll singer, guitar player in a band. Um, but at the same time, I kind of wanted to be like a composer too, you know? And um, um, life circumstance didn't really go that way. Like, you know, to be a composer, you know, you kind of have to uh, go to music school, right? And um, I didn't finish high school. It was, you know, uh, mostly by design. Like, I didn't want to. I did not like school. Like, I didn't like... I felt imprisoned in rooms when there were, like, beautiful days outside and stuff like that. You know, I was kind of restless, and um, I didn't feel like school was teaching me th nearly as much as I learned, like, you know, I don't know, being involved in life, you know, uh, folks on the street, you know, whatever, like, they didn't teach us the real politics of things, they didn't teach us the real language of things, you know, in English. Um, You know, like, and, and I felt like that about the music, too. Like, um, I did have one, my last teacher ever in school was a music teacher, and um, and he was awesome, and he was very mind-opening, and kind of his class was about, like, music is about much more than you think it is. That was sort of what he was teaching us was, you know, um, I think he was from that kind of fluxus generation and, um, you know, had like presented us, we're like kids in high school, right? And he's presenting us with all these conceptual ideas about, you know, getting us to think about what is music and like, you know, um, yeah, awesome. I mean, really, Richard O'Connor, you know. Anyway, I was only in his class for a couple of days. Um, and that was the end of my formal education. So the music school thing wasn't happening. And, um, but I still wanted to be a composer, right, all this time. Like, you know, I, oh, I love Bartok and Debussy and Stravinsky and, you know, like, there is something about music like that that you can't touch with a combo, you know, with your five-piece band. You know, it's, it's, and it's not just that it's more complicated, it's that it can get into these other areas, you know. And anyhow, like, I never felt completely satisfied with being a player of an instrument performing, you know. And I didn't particularly... Um, well, the life around that is, is, you know, if you're going to make a living at that, you're going to be playing in a lot of bars, you know. I mean, you could get really famous and be like a star or something, but, um, yeah, <laughs> that happens or it don't, right? And if it doesn't, like, you're playing in bars, I don't know. I don't just love bars that much. You know, I've spent plenty of time and I'm just like anybody else. And, you know, I'm not anti, you know, um, I'm not, you know, like I drink beers and stuff like that. Uh, but I don't really like an alcohol-based life, you know. Um, yeah, it just, it's, that's not me. I'm not really into that. And, um, you know, same with the band thing. I'm not really into a, you know, an opiate-based lifestyle or, a, you know, <laughs> or whatever-based lifestyle. You know, I want to have a lifestyle based on, like, just being a human being, right? You know, 
not like an alcoholic human being or a cocaine addicted human being or whatever. And um, anyhow, so so the thing is like, what do you do when you kind of have this, you know, idea that being a musician means being a composer, you know? And I grew up on tons of that, you know. My dad knew a lot about music and. Um, in a very classical sense, you know, he like thought Beethoven was the summit of achievement, and you know, I remember him going through a Mozart phase and a Bach phase, and you know, he kept going backwards, you know, receding in time. Um, didn't like modernism very much at all. But anyhow, like the, um, you know, I love the theoretical knowledge of it and the, the sort of scholarship involved in the. You know all the thinking about it. Like I, I really um, respected that, and so you know, and so all the time I was doing stuff. You know, um, you know, my primary focus was, you know, in my early twenties was playing jazz and playing the saxophone and playing in bars. And um, you know, later on, it was I switched back to guitar again. I started out on guitar, switched to saxophone, switched back to guitar again as a primary instrument. But the whole time, this other current was going along, in which I was, you know, reading every theory book I could get my hand on, and listening, and you know, um, even when I was playing jazz, I listened to as much Bartok and Stravinsky and Debussy as I as I did to, you know. Uh, well, lots of Mingus, of course, you know, and Duke Ellington and Eric Dolphy and Andrew Hill, you know, like, I was compositionally interested by jazz. There's plenty to get compositionally interested in, in jazz, too. But I always had that thing going on. And, um, <laughs> however, my reading skills have never been very good, and my writing skills have never been really good. It's, um, I began to think because uh, I sort of after a while like I, I disliked Mozart for a really long time and most of Bach I don't like and and Beethoven too and I began to think that part of the problem with that music was that it was written down you know because as a composer, you're writing things so that you tend to do the, the things that I really don't like about classical music is the amount of repetitive rhythmic figures in them. So there's all the imitations and you know um, canonical fugue writing, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's totally understandable why you're sitting there writing things out and you're figuring out all these little squiggles. Oh, like I've got this rhythmic figure. It's like, you know, this one and these dotted ones are, you know, whatever. Like, um, and so they repeat them all the time and they just move them around pitch wise and, you know, there you end up with music. It's like, you know, um, you just take the same thing and just do it over and over and over and over again, right? And um, and that's cool, you know? Um, of course that's what you do, right? But um, I always thought that was part of, part of the reason that that became so, I don't know, that becomes lifeless to me after a while. Um, in a certain sense, like if you don't know anything about it, like when I first began to study that, like, oh, it was so cool how they kept like reinvigorating the same theme and, you know, this sense of organization around it. And um, But eventually it just, um, like you understand the procedures that they use to do these things and you just know they're coming. And it's the same thing as, uh, you know, uh, oh, our local band at the local bar, 
you know, was this blues band, you know. And um, <laughs> after a while, you're sitting there, and they were good and fun, and like, you know, a splendid time was had by all. But, well, they weren't that, it's not like they were great or anything. Um, you know, just local folks playing at the bar. But um, after a while, everything kind of goes, you know, and this turnaround comes, and it just starts feeling inevitable. And, you know, um, myth of Sisyphus, you know, it's kind of, um, no, that rock's rolling right down the hill, you know, and, um, <laughs> but the same thing happens in Bach, you know. You know, Bach has this one, you know, this a two five one thing, you know, this dun 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 dun, you know, and that kind of, you know, with different permutations of that, that just kind of happens every sixteen bars, you know. Um, you know, and Beethoven has his ones, you know, dun 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 dun. Ta -da! You know, and you just you're just getting set up for you know this Sisyphus moment, right? Um, and I thought at the time, and still kind of do, you know, that oh, just this huge bulk of that music comes from the busy work of writing it down, you know. And if you're going to write it down and you get to just kind of copy shit that you already wrote down. They call it development. Um, <laughs> that just makes it so easy, right? So as a person doing a job, you know, like I know when I'm building stuff and I make something, I can't see anything here that has a lot of the same parts. You just figure out ways of cranking out bunches of parts, right? So you're a composer and your job is to fill up this time, so you just crank out these parts and then just, you know, it's way faster than <coughs> making each one by itself and reinventing the wheel all the time. Anyhow, so like, that sort of took that, that was taken out of my equation of being a composer from both sides of this. Um, I don't think that writing the music down on paper contributes to the music in a positive way. I think it, it ends up making it, oh, that really mechanical sound, you know, it drives me crazy listening to classical music sometimes. But, you know, it's so obvious on a page why you would do this, you know. Like, you don't even really have to hear it, and, you know, um, and this is why Beethoven could write when he was deaf, is because, like, you already know how to do this. This is why Mozart could write a 15-minute symphony in five minutes, because he knew this part was going to come, and you just stick all this stuff in there, right? And... And you just use these boring rhythmic figures, you know, and... Rock and roll works the same way, you know, you have these rhythmic figures, you know, I, you know, especially as a, you know, young hormonal man, like, really preferred the, the basic rhythmic figures of rock music a lot more than the, you know, stick up their ass Mozart ones, right, you know, or Bach ones, you know. Um, you know, there's something way cooler about... <laughs> You know, that's like kind of cooler than um, you know, like, yeah, man, that shit's lame, right? So, um, they only really get that kind of sound of music. Um, when it's written down. And so, feeding into this was that um, Duke Ellington and Mingus wouldn't let their musicians read their music. They'd make them learn it with their ears, you know? Um, 
Mingus even had like battles and fights. The reason that John Handy quit his band in the 60s and boy, John Handy played beautiful on, you know, all good by pork pie hat and stuff like that. Like um, the Alice's Wonderland stuff with, with him and Booker Irwin, like, man, John Handy was good. And, and like their, you know, John Handy with Mingus was really something. And, um, but he wanted to have a chart and Mingus wouldn't let him have it. And they had um, like rumored to be like serious fights about this, like, you know, bordering on violence fights because Mingus wouldn't let John Handy write something down and write his part down. No, you had to play it and it had to like, you know, be from there. Uh, Duke Ellington taught all of us, and these are sometimes very complex arrangements without any sheet music. You know, no, we want this to sound like it does, you know. And um, so from that end, I'm sort of cut off from being a composer because I feel the same, oh, the same kind of thing as like, um, <laughs> as they do about that, the writing down of it, like, poisons the music somehow. And, um, and I still believe that. I like lots of music that's written down, you know. Um, and some people are, you know, um, some people really can do that, you know. Debussy writes down music without any of that stuff in it, and that's why it's so good, is that there's, you know, there's fluidity, it doesn't, Default into this dun da da dun da da dun da 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 thing, you know. Um, Stravinsky uses that thing, you know. Um, his his biographer refers to it as motor rhythms, and he does use those, but he always like breaks them up somewhere, and like you know, when when he's good, there's a whole lot of unexpected coming along, you know. I really don't like when he just kind of defaults to that. I, I loathe a Puccinella suite, you know. Like I really can't stay on that one, you know. <laughs> but anyhow, um, and then from the other side is like, well, I didn't go to school. Nobody's going to take me seriously as a composer. I'm not going to go to some, you know, group of people that play and say, well, I, you know, you know, I drop out of high school, but here's this stuff, you know, like, will you play this, you know? Uh, it's not like, you know, if I had a bunch of money, you could pay them to do it. But, um, but other than that, that's just not going to happen. So it was still all along, I still wanted, you know, you know, as well as having an inner Eric Dolphy and an inner Charlie Parker and an inner Charles Mingus. I also have a, you know, an inner Stravinsky and an inner Eric Satie, you know, like, um, <laughs> anyhow, like, I, I feel really um, like this is a great time because those of us who feel that way, you know, who want that kind of meta thing, you know, as opposed to just being performers on instruments, um, that with recording technology like it is, and when I was coming up, that was really expensive. Like, you needed tape, and you needed big fat tape that, you know, cost a hundred bucks a reel, and you needed machines that cost thousands of dollars and stuff like that. And not anymore, man. You've got a microphone, a little thing, you know, you know. You can have an unlimited track studio in your computer if you want to, you know. I unfortunately think the computer thing um, does the same thing as the writing thing does. And um, not so much in that it makes people be as repetitive as the, you know, it's kind of arduous work sitting there like, filling in some and not filling in others and putting the dots and the flags, you know, it's, I think it's hard work scoring music on a, by hand on paper, you know. Um, and so not in that way, but I think that 
looking at the music instead of listening to it. You know, the computer kind of compels you to do that. Um, and so I think that damages it as well. You know, I think it takes that sort of sensuality and immediacy out of it. By recording, like, um, so recording is, is open to how we can compose now. And I think that's a cool thing that, you know, um, yeah, I think that's very liberating. And it takes you out of those two things. You can still compose music even though you didn't go to school and can't get anybody to do it. And you can still compose music even though you don't want to sit there and kind of do bookkeeping, you know. And I feel like we'll probably see the concept of composition grow quite a bit over, you know, whatever the next time period of music is. I have no idea what that even means, but, you know, um, I think that's sort of cool. I think it's cool that we get to, like, directly compose the music itself from sound itself and not be, like, filtered through scores, you know? I don't think it really helps to, um, it doesn't for me anyway, it's, I don't want to manage samples you know, or whatever, um, in that same kind of, oh, yeah, I, I think of it as sort of like bookkeeping, and um, I don't want to do that either. Like, I don't, think, I don't think that's all that different from the scoring thing. You know, the technology is different, like, no longer restricted to a quill pen and some fool's cap or whatever, you know. It's, um, <laughs> But like, yeah, people can go directly into sound with music, and I think we'll probably end up getting like some really great music out of it, of all all sorts, you know. So yay for the 21st century. Where you can clap with one hand, you know that. There's the sound of one hand clapping, it's not very loud. <laughs>